Um, I'm not going to use the microphone. If I'm not loud enough, just uh, let me know. Uh, so uh, if you're here, you're here uh, to hear about cloud native application development with Spring. Uh, so we're going to be talking about that today and a little bit of Cloud Foundry as well. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'm Kenny Bastani. I am a Spring developer advocate at the Pivotal on the Spring team. Uh, I joined back in September. Before that, I was at Neo4j, their graph database company, as well as uh, Digital Insight. She used to be into it. Um, I'm writing a book right now with a developer advocate, Josh Long. It's called Cloud Native Java. Uh, it's from O'Reilly. You can get an early release of it today. Uh, this book is all about building cloud native JVM applications and microservices using Spring Boot, uh, Spring Cloud, and Cloud Foundry. Also, I am, I am from Silicon Valley. Uh, so I live in San Mateo, California. Doing a trip through APJ, uh, I went to Tokyo, uh, Seoul, and then now Singapore. I go to Las Vegas tomorrow for the oh, some of you. Yes. All right, let's do that all again now for the, I'm kidding. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm headed to Las Vegas tomorrow to uh, go to EMC World to give a talk. It's a busy schedule. Today, uh, for our agenda, I'm gonna talk about uh, microservices primarily, talk about cloud native applications. Uh, talk about Spring Boot. Who's, uh, who's using Spring Boot today? Wow. Who's using classic Spring Framework? Who doesn't use Spring? <laughs> okay, so we'll talk about Spring Boot. We'll talk about Spring Cloud. Uh, Spring Cloud is, uh, is a tool set that we provide in the Spring ecosystem for tying together your distributed app applications. Uh, so if you have a lot of microservices and they're Spring Boot applications, uh, you can use Spring Cloud. Uh, so we'll primarily focus on Spring Cloud today um, because that's how you build cloud native applications. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about REST. I'll show you an example architecture of 10 microservices I put together. Um, this is a cloud native application, which is an online store. Uh, so we'll, uh, I'll show you that. Okay, so let's start with microservices. So when we talk about building microservices, uh, we have to really look back and, and see what our application architecture looked like before we embarked on that journey. Uh, who here today is uh, working on microservices or looking to adopt microservices? One, two, three, okay. <laughs> well, it's gonna be a very boring presentation. Um, okay, but so we started with the monolithic application pattern. And with a monolithic application, we have our users coming in and they're accessing our application as a web application that's deployed to an Apache Tomcat server or Java application server like IBM WebSphere or Apache Tomcat. There's a few different ones. Uh, so with this model, we're going to have our uh, development teams organize uh, and work on modules in a single deployment. So here we have a war file deployment. In a war file deployment, we might have different components. So we have modularity. Here we have the storefront UI, the accounting service, the inventory service, the shipping service. And if we have a large engineering team, and they're all working on the same application, uh, the problem is, is there are going to be a lot of conflicts. So the velocity of getting into production is going to slow down, right? Another problem is that when we have an application server deployment, uh, we have to set up provision virtual machines, install the application server to those machines. It takes a lot of time. Uh, so that's something that we want to prevent if possible. Also, we have a bottleneck here, which is our relational database. So uh, typically what we'll have in an organization is we'll have DBAs who are managing the database schema. Uh, if we have any requests or any features to modify the application and it requires a change to the database, we have to make a request, we have to go through gatekeepers, we have to go through reviews, uh, and uh, it's two months before you get anything done. And so this is a very inflexible model, uh, so we can do better. So we uh, decided to move to a uh, different kind of architecture, which is a service-oriented architecture. So now, instead of one monolithic application deployment, uh, where everybody's working on the same code base, we have, a, we have more uh, services that we're deploying. So we have independent deployments. Here I have the accounting service, I have the inventory service, I have the shipping service, and I have a set of domain resources where I'm sharing between the services. We have a single service team typically working on each service, but you can have individual service teams work on these applications. So we've removed this, uh, we removed one bottleneck, which is that we have one application deployment. We actually can scale these applications independently as well. But the problem becomes now that instead of one large application deployment, we have, uh, we have a few different application deployments that we have to coordinate at the same time. Because we have these resources here at the bottom that we're sharing, if I make a change to the customer or account or address record, if the accounting service owns those records, then the inventory service has to account for that change. 
So now with the complexity of this architecture, if I make a change anywhere in the resources that we're sharing or the shared libraries, I have to deploy multiple services at the same time. So I have to coordinate multiple releases instead of one large release that takes a lot of time. And so this is still an inflexible model, so we can do better. So we've arrived at microservices, which is this application pattern where uh, we kind of analyze the monolithic application deployment. We've analyzed the service-oriented architecture, the shortfalls of these application architectures, and we've come up with a better model. So uh, here we have, uh, as a rule, each team and organization is going to get one service, one application, and one database. And uh, the idea here is that it's more flexible. So when we have a team of developers working at a company, and they're organizing around uh, business capabilities, that is, they're organizing around certain features of the business that they want uh, to have implemented. Uh, for instance, here we have a movie application where I have a user service, I have a movie service, a rating service, a recommendation service, and an analysis service. And so each one of these represents a team, and we can deploy these applications independently of one another. So I don't have to coordinate my deployments anymore, because I'm going to use integration tests across all of my applications to make sure things are correct before they go to a production environment. Uh, I'm going to have my consumers drive those tests. So if I'm a movie service here, and there's a dependency from the rating service, the movie service is going to have a set of tests that are implemented by the rating service. They're defined by the consumer. And those tests are going to run when this application goes through its deployment pipeline. So before this application can get to production, it needs to pass a series of tests that were defined by the rating service. This is called consumer-driven testing. And so what happens here is that the movie service wants to move at their own pace. They want to implement breaking changes and screw everyone's life up. But what's going to happen here is they can't actually get into production unless they pass the consumer-driven tests. So the rating service is going to be the one that the movie service contacts and says, hey, we have a problem. So culturally, things change, where instead of moving at your own pace, where everybody comes to you and says, there's a breaking change, uh, your consumers are going to drive that. So you're going to have to go and talk to the rating service and say, hey, there was this problem with your uh, consumer test. We need to fix that. And so there's a lot more work here uh, for this application to work with other teams that uh, depend on it. A uh, big difference here is, too is that I'm going to choose the database that I want for my use case. This is called polyglot persistence. And so if I want to use, for, for instance, for the rating service, I have a very connected data model. If I want to use a graph database, which is a connected data, it's a connected data model, uh, it's going to use a graph model in the database, I can go ahead and choose that application, uh, the database, and deploy it myself. So as a team, I'm going to operate my own software. So I'll deploy the rating service. I'll deploy the database. I'll manage that myself. So we don't have a central DBA who's managing these changes anymore. I can choose a different database for any one of my services. So at the bottom here, we have the recommendation service. And I'm using MongoDB. So I can choose the database that I want. Another thing about uh, microservice architecture is that I can also have shared resources. So we have a couch-based document database in the center. And I'm using that as a centralized cache. So I can also share resources. One of the problems that we have with a microservice architecture is that we move away from a monolithic application transaction model, where if I have a database transaction and something fails, I can roll back to a consistent state within the scope of that transaction. So now my transactions are spanning multiple applications where I have to keep track. Let's say that a user rates a movie. Well, I might be touching data in each database. So I need to worry about how I roll back my transactions that are now distributed. Uh, so I can use another shared resource in the middle. I can add something like Apache Kafka. And I can store an event log. So every, every application uh, change that requires the change to state can be recorded in an Apache Kafka uh, instance. I can have an event log where I can roll back across multiple services um, if I get my application into an inconsistent state. So typically, people ask, uh, how, do I, I mean, how do I understand conceptualizing this migration to microservices from a monolithic application? So uh, in the book, I describe uh, a method where you can actually take your monolithic application, turn it into a series of microservices. Uh, so here in this uh, example diagram, we have a budding microservice architecture. And in this architecture, I have my customer service, which represents my backend application. So this is a data service. You can see that it's connected to a MySQL database. We can see what the schema looks like. We have an account record, a customer record, and a user record. And what we'd like to do is to, trans, uh, to transform this customer service into multiple applications that we can deploy independently. 
Uh, so we've already started that process. We've created, this is an online banking application. We have our front end here. Now we've extracted out the front end, which used to exist in the customer service, and we've created a new application. So this is just going to have the front end components. Uh, and it's going to integrate with the customer service over REST. So maybe I have an Angular JS application here. It's going to use a REST API that's exposed by the customer service uh, to display data to the user. I've also added in some cloud native application components. I can see at the top that I have the discovery service. This is going to allow uh, these applications to find each other when they get to an environment. So if I deploy the online banking application, when it starts up in an environment, it's going to contact the discovery service. It's going to provide information of where it can be contacted on the network. And the discovery service is going to maintain a registry of all the applications in an environment. So we provide this with Spring Cloud. Also, I've added a configuration server. This is going to allow me to centralize my configurations. Uh, I can use a Git repository to do so. I can store a file for each one of these services, a application properties file. So when it gets deployed to an environment, It'll contact the configuration server. It'll grab its configuration, attach it, and start running. Also, with a configuration server, I can go ahead and if I need to make a configuration change with applications that are running, uh, let's say I have 10 instances of the online banking application, I need to make a config change. I can go ahead and check that into the Git repository. The configuration server will notify all the applications in the architecture that depend on that configuration, and they'll take that new configuration in and reload. You don't have to restart the application. So the next step here, if we want to split this customer service into uh, more microservice, microservices, we might want to choose one of these tables from the database and create a new application out of it. So what I've done here is I've migrated the user table that used to exist in the customer DB, um, which had all feature functionality related to user level authentication. I've refactored that out of the customer service and I've created a new application called the user service. Now for any functionality related to users, the user service inside of this application, I've now rerouted it to the user service. And I don't need to go and edit manual configurations or add new host names. Uh, because these applications are able to use the discovery service, I can add as many as I want and the discovery service is going to take care of how these applications find each other. As long as I give an ID to one of these services, they'll be able to find each other if they depend on each other in an environment. So with cloud native applications, uh, there's really one uh, set of methodologies today that a lot of people use when they build applications, and that's called 12-factor application methodology. Who's heard of 12-factor apps? Don't be shy. <laughs> Great, I have. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to go over all 12 of those now. I'm kidding. I'm just going to go over two. Uh, and the first one I'm going to talk about is configuration. Uh, so the main thing that changes here is that we have a single code base, and we're separating out our configurations. We're going to store those in the environment. So we're not going to store any configurations related to the environment inside the code base. We're going to take those and store them in the environment. And here, with Spring Cloud, we can use the configuration server to do that. So what a 12-factor application really is, is it's really a set of methodologies that allow us to deploy, build an application and deploy it to any cloud platform, such as Cloud Foundry, for instance. So this is the first step that we're going to do. We're going to take our monolithic application, we're going to separate out all the configuration and store it in the environment. The other one is that we're going to have one immutable artifact that we produce, one code base that we build. And that artifact is going to be deployed to each of the environments. So I'm only going to build once. When I build once, I'm going to have that same artifact. When it goes into dev, I can promote that to QA, staging, and production. But I'm not going to rebuild that application in each environment. There's only one build that happens, and we promote that to the other environments. So when we're building cloud native applications, there's really only one great framework uh, that I recommend. And that's Spring Boot. And Spring Boot really is a JVM uh, framework for building microservices. I really need to get a clicker. <laughs> OK, so what is uh, Spring Boot? So raise your hand if you've seen this famous diagram. It's famous. Promise. OK, so Phil Webb, he's the co-lead of the Spring Boot project. He helped uh, found the project itself. And he explained the difference between classic Spring Framework and Spring Boot in one simple diagram. And he said that. Well, Spring Framework really is just a, a set of ingredients that when you compose together, you get a finished baked cake. But the problem is, is that we have to bake our cakes ourselves with the classic Spring Framework. And what ends up happening is that 
developers spend all their day in XML rather than in Java. So Java developers pick up a competency of be being an expert in XML, which is not very fun. And so with each one of these, ing <laughs> these ingredients, for Flower, for instance, might represent spring security, or eggs might represent spring data. Uh, so we have all of these projects in the Spring ecosystem that Spring Boot, simply what it does is it composes them all together into a finished baked cake. So instead of having to configure your own beans in your Spring container, Spring Boot's going to do that for you with default configurations. And you're going to use annotations now instead of uh, actually jumping into XML and making a lot of changes there. You'll use Java-based configuration. So when it comes to actually Baking these cake, we, uh, cakes, we provide something called the Spring Initializer. Uh, and the Spring Initializer is really an open source project we have as a website. You can go to start.spring.io, where we host an instance of it. Uh, and you can specify what your ingredients are. We have, these are called starter projects. So if I want to build a web service, I can use web, JPA, security, actuator, REST repositories. I'm actually going to build that now so you can see. And you can download this application and start it immediately. So if we go to start.spring.io, so here's the Spring Initializer. Now this is just an open source project that we provide, uh, meaning that if you want to deploy your own instance of it at your company and customize it, you're more than welcome. So the basic uh, gist of this is, is that I can put in my dependencies here. Let's say that I want this to be a web application. I can embed a Apache Tomcat server inside my jar, uh, my jar artifact, so I'll choose web. Let's say we want to use Spring Data JPA because we'll connect to a MySQL database. We need a MySQL database driver, so I can use H2 here. Uh, I can also use MySQL, but the idea here of using H2 is that if I'm going to do um, unit testing or integration testing, I can embed an in-memory instance of the H2 database, and then I can run execute my tests against that database. I'll also choose REST repositories because I want to have a REST API be exposed for my data model. I'm going to choose Spring Boot Actuator. This is going to uh, map a series of endpoints uh, to my, my REST service, which is going to expose operational metrics for my application. Also, I want this to use the discovery service, so I'll go ahead and specify Eureka Discovery. I'll just rename this to user service. And up top here, you can choose if you want a Gradle project or a Maven project. I'm going to choose Maven, and then I'm going to use the current version of Spring Boot, 1.3.3. So I can go ahead and generate that project, and it's going to give me a compressed file here, which I can open up. Um, you can extract it, and I'm going to show you the finished version of this. So you're going to get you're going to get a series of files here. So this is just basically a Java project. We see here a source directory. We have a target directory because uh, I've already built this. We also get a Maven wrapper. So I can actually, instead of having to install the version of Maven um, that I specify with uh, my Spring Boot application, I'll get a wrapper. And I can use that wrapper uh, instead. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and run this application. So I will use Maven Spring Boot run. This is going to compile the application and start it. And so if I go to that application, it's going to be localhost 8080. Actually, it's going to be dynamic. Let's try that again. One sec. I had an elaborate. This is how many times I've done the demo this week. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a bit. Uh, all right, so let's go to 8. OK, let's try that again. OK, so we can see that the application started up on port 8080. Uh, so I'll go ahead and go to localhost 8080. And we can see that I have a hypermedia response here from that application. So this is just a default response. Um, so we use hypermedia. This is hot EOS. It's going to provide a series of links of how you can uh, work with this application as a REST API. Also, I have uh, actuator on here. So if I go to forward slash actuator, I can see all those operational endpoints. So I can see I have environment. There's, there's a lot of them. Um, but I'll go over just a few. If I go to ENV, 
I get a uh, list of properties and environment variables for the um, application environment where this application is running. And I can see all those system pro properties of my machine. I can also look at the environment variables. So here uh, we can see my uh, AWS secret key somewhere in here, um, but it's obscured. I don't know where, there it is. So I, I see that automatically Spring Boot will detect, it'll look at the name of the environment variable and it'll obs obscure anything that's sensitive. Uh, so this is very useful in a production environment. So you can see information about the application running an environment. One of the other really helpful endpoints is the metrics endpoint. So here I can see um, information about um, my application, I can how it relates to the JVM, uh, the heap size, how much memory is free. I can see my thread count and my thread pool. I can do a, I can actually uh, do a thread, um, a thread dump as well. I can see the amount of classes uh, that are loaded. I can also see um, how many times uh, a user's access to a specific endpoint. So we can see here that I have actuator, and you can see the amount of times that it responded. Doesn't seem right, but um, I've run this application a few times. So let's go back to actuator. Um, there's also health. I can look at health, it's basic health in, endpoint. So here I see information about this service running. We can see that I've added Eureka Discovery as a client, but it's not connected. Um, so you can also see the status of the database. See here I'm using H2. So this is the basic uh, idea behind Spring Boot, is that it's very, very easy to generate these applications using our Spring Initializer project as a finished application and run it and start to configure it. So it's very popular today. Back in January 2015, we had uh, just under a million downloads a month. Uh, today, actually, we're well over three million. Um, this was in December, uh, which was 2.25 million. So that's a tremendous amount of growth for any application framework. Uh, and the reason for that is that microservices have become a very popular pattern for a lot of companies. And they're adopting Spring Boot mostly because they have Spring competency. Uh, but it's designed for microservices. So you can rapidly build these applications uh, at an increased velocity, and you don't have to spend all day in manual configuration. So the other uh, thing we'll talk about today is Spring Cloud. So Spring Cloud is a, another ecosystem project that we have, and so this solves the problem of building distributed ap applications. So with Spring Cloud, we really provide a set of integrations. So most of all, we have the Netflix open source project. So we bring in a lot of the, uh, the Spring Boot based applications or Spring applications that are in the Netflix open source ecosystem like uh, Zool or uh, like uh, Eureka Discovery. And we create integrations for those with Spring Boot. We also provide a lot of uh, integrations with Amazon Web Services, with Cloud Foundry. Uh, and we also provide discovery options with Apache Zookeeper and Console. So this is very popular as well uh, because it provides a lot of these patterns, these operational patterns that you need when you build distributed applications. And so uh, some of the patterns that we provide, service discovery, which I'm going to go over in a second. This allows applications to find each other in an environment. Uh, API gateway. So when you have a lot of these backend microservices, you're going to need a way to expose a seamless REST API to your front end application developers. And so we have an API gateway um, that you can use to uh, string them together. Uh, we provide a configuration server, so you can centralize your configurations uh, in an environment. You can run this service. Uh, it can serve your uh, configurations to each of your services in the uh, architecture. We also provide circuit breakers, which, which is an operational resiliency pattern. Um, with circuit breakers, let's say that you have a large microservice architecture, 500 plus microservices, and you have one of those microservices is a critical dependency, meaning a lot of your applications are going to have that as a dependency. And when that becomes the case, if that service goes down, then you're kind of screwed, right? All of your applications are going to go down. So we provide circuit breakers, which is a way for you to specify a default fallback functionality. So if the circuit is tripped, and there's a high velocity of errors, it's going to fall back to this default functionality. So your applications can still function. It's just going to have some default fallback functionality. Uh, we also provide distributed tracing integration uh, with Zipkin. So you can visualize how your microservices are communicating with each other, uh, which becomes a very um, simple way to debug these applications. So when you have all this complexity, 
Uh, it's good to have something like a Chrome developer tools to actually visualize how these things are communicating. So I'm going to go over uh, each one of those patterns uh, in a second. But uh, going back to Phil Webb's wisdom on the difference between Spring Framework and Spring Boot, he had another tweet which said, well, if this is my Spring Boot application, Spring Cloud is just a lot of cupcakes with different <laughs> flavors. And so what that looks like here, let's say we have our three cupcakes. We have the recommendation service, the movie service, a configuration service, and a discovery service. So I'm going to go over how the discovery service is used in this scenario. So there's a dependence, let's assume there's a dependency between the recommendation service and the movie service. So with, the ser with service discovery, these applications, the recommendation service and movie service, uh, they're going to find each other in the environment because they're going to use the discovery service, which is going to centralize information about these applications. And so here we have our service registry. So when an application starts up, it's going to contact discovery service. It's going to provide information of where it's located on the network. And the discovery service's sole responsibility is to maintain the service registry. And this is kind of like a phone book. So this phone book is going to have uh, the IP address, the phone number of where these applications can be contacted. Also, it's going gonna, it's gonna to serve a list of instances. So I can actually do something called client-side load balancing, which is that if I want to load balance between applications from the client side, I can now do that because I have information related to each instance. So I'm actually going to demo this. So using that user service, uh, let's go ahead and add in another application. So what we're going to do here is we're going to add a discovery service. Uh, we're going to add a client application that's going to contact the user service. And we're going to scale multiple instances of the user service. And we're going to see the user client application automatically load balance between these services. So what I'll do is I'll go to start.spring.io. I'm going to specify that I want Eureka. So I'll choose Eureka server. And I'll go ahead and generate. So I have the finished application here. So if we look at the POM XML, we'll see that <clears throat> the configuration that was generated will have a Spring Cloud Starter Eureka server. I also have a Spring Boot Starter test. So we have unit testing built in. Um, my parent uh, dependency here, my parent build dependency, this is a bomb. And uh, this pulls in all the Spring Cloud Starter projects. We also have a uh, Spring Boot Starter parent, which does the same just for Spring Boot Starter projects. If I go to the application class here, I can see there's not much uh, going on. There's just one, one Java application class. Um, and here we have enable Eureka server. This is going to enable this application as a Eureka server. It's all I need to do. I'm also going to go into the application properties. I'll name this discovery-service, and I'll set it to a default port of 8761. Now I'm going to go and start that application. We can see that it started up. So I'm just going to go to the browser now. If I go to localhost 8761, we can see the Spring Eureka UI. So uh, this, is, uh, this started at Netflix, and we create the integration for it. Um, and so this is just one of the three discovery services that we provide. Um, so what you'll see here in this user interface is just some information related to our application instances that are registered. So we can see here there's no instances that are available or registered. So what we want to do here is we want to add in a user service and a user client application. So we downloaded the user service earlier, and I've since uh, gone ahead and while you weren't looking, I added up some code in there. And uh, what I want to demonstrate here is that uh, we're gonna, we had that uh, Eureka starter project. So I'm going to add an annotation here at the top, which is enable discovery client. That's going to automatically uh, enable this application to contact Eureka uh, and register with it. I've also added in a basic REST controller here. Um, and why I've done this is I just want to show how this application is going to load balance. And so what I've done here is I've mapped server.port to a property, a field here, which I'm going to return at the, 
default endpoint. So we can see the application port um, that this uh, service is running on. So if I go ahead and start that up, So we can see that it started up. Um, oh, I got to restart. Sorry. My bad. This is. Uh, I'm going to assign it a port of 1111 just to make things simple. So we can see that it started up on port 1111. And we see that it also. Uh, contact the discovery service and registered. So we see a 204 success. So if I go back to Eureka, where are you? Oh, I had it up, didn't I? OK, if I refresh it, now we can see the instances that are registered. So this, uh, discovery service went ahead and registered itself. And then we see the user service, which is registered. And here's how I contact it. So I have uh, a link here where I can open up that application. And it's going to give me an error, which is fine. So if I go to the root endpoint here, now I see 1111. So what we'd like to do here is to add another instance to Eureka. So I'll go ahead and run another application. I'm going to assign the port 1112. Now if I reload Eureka, I can see that now I have two instances that are running of the user service, one on port 1112 and one on 1111. And now what I'd like to do is to create another application that also connects to Eureka that I'm going to use a REST client from that application to contact the user service, and it's going to automatically load balance. Where do you have configured it? It's discovering these services. Yeah, I've, all I've done is add an annotation to. So, but how is it looking for port number? Or the default port, good, very good question, by the way. Um, the default port for Eureka is 8761. Okay. So, I don't need to specify a URL or a port number um, if it's localhost 8761. Yeah. So, that's just a little bit of magic. Uh, so, yeah, I can actually show you what that looks like in a production application. Uh, so, now I'll create a user client. Um, so I've, I've gone ahead and generated this. Um, so we can see here that I have my Spring Cloud Starter Eureka dependency, and I've also ha added a um, starter web. So I'm going to run a REST API from this. If I go to the application class, I can see here that I have, um, I've added that annotation at the top, which is enable discovery client. And I've, I've also created a bean here, which is uh, called the REST template. Now, the REST template is a very common bean that we use uh, to contact other services. It's just a REST client. Um, now, the big difference here is that I can add another annotation uh, called load balance, which is going to create this instance as a load balance REST client, which means that it's going to take advantage of the service registry, and it's going to load balance between instances of services. I've created a REST controller here as well. So here we have uh, basically two fields, which is we have our load balance REST template. And we have a discovery client. So I have a client for the discovery service. And I can use that to get information about the services that are registered with Eureka. And I'm going to go ahead and map that to the root endpoint here uh, so we can actually get all instances of the user service and return that back as JSON. So the magic here uh, is actually in this forward slash user dash service. So what I'm illustrating here is something called reverse proxy, which is that I'm going to call the user service from this uh, endpoint that we're accessing on the client application. And it's going to forward the request to the user service. And we can see here that I'm using HTTP user dash service. So we, we know that this is actually not a domain, a valid domain. But the REST template is going to automatically translate that key to an IP address, which is stored in the service registry. So if I go ahead and run this application, So we see that it started up. And if I refresh Eureka, we can see now that I have a user client. And if I navigate 
and go to the root endpoint, we can see here's the information for that first mapping. We have uh, information about all of the user service instances. So here I see instance one, which is at this address. And we have instance two. Now I'm going to demonstrate the reverse proxy. If I go to forward slash user dash service, we can see that if I reload, it's going to load balance between those applications. So I can add as many instances as I want, and it's automatically going to load balance. So that's the core idea behind Spring Cloud, um, is that it really provides you a set of features for managing distributed systems. Uh, I think client-side load balancing is an excellent example of that. So we also provide a configuration service. I won't demo this, but the idea here is that I can have a service that I deploy to an environment that's going to map to a Git repository where I've stored uh, centralized journal configurations. So I can actually go to a Git repository, make a change to a file, check it in. The configuration service will pick up that change and broadcast it out to uh, the applications that depend on that config. So I have uh, two environments here. I have one for staging and I have one for production. The API gateway is uh, one of the most important uh, features that we have in um, Spring Cloud. The idea here is that I can go ahead and add a service which is going to download the routes from my microservices, my REST API here and here, and expose that as a single gateway. So it's going to automatically download those routes and it's going to embed that uh, inside of itself, which I can then reverse proxy in the same way that I showed you in the controller. Uh, so let's talk about REST a little bit. Uh, as a part of uh, Spring Data, we provide uh, Hot EOS, which is Hypermedia as the engine of application state, um, which is really just REST APIs that self-describe. And uh, it's pronounced Hot TOS, like Honey Oat Cereal, um, not Hate OS. <laughs> uh, so this is based off of Leonard Richardson's maturity model. Uh, so the expressiveness of our APIs uh, uh, this uh, pyramid here shows that we started at level zero, which was single URI, single verb, and we moved up uh, to be become more expressive until we reached level three, which is the top of the pyramid, which is that our uh, REST APIs are going to fully describe every single function um, that is provided with a part of that service. And so we uh, have this as a built-in feature with um, Spring. So now going back to the REST API gateway, tying this all together. The API gateway is going to reveal a series of links to our backend microservices as reverse proxy. When we communicate with those services, it's going to forward on the request to the backend microservice and return back a response. Uh, and so what this looks like is that uh, here's my root endpoint for the edge service or API gateway. We have three microservices here. We have the rating service, the product service, and the user service. So this is hypermedia. It's uh, returning just a set of links that I can uh, browse, and uh, it's very similar. Who's used Swagger? Swagger? So it's similar to Swagger. Um, so we actually have in the Spring ecosystem a browser for this. Uh, because it provides all the information of what you can do in the API, you can build a browser on top of this, very similar to Swagger. So if I uh, traverse, let's say I traverse the user's endpoint, I will um, go to It'll route the request to the user service and return back the response. So here I have a Spring Data repository. Um, we can see that this is a paging and sorting repository. So I have a list of functional links. Uh, we see here first, next, last, and search. We have a search method. And it's going to return back that page of results. So I can page through this and return back um, different results. OK, so now I'm going to take questions before I get into the reference architecture. Um, but I'm going to put this up so that we can talk about it. So uh, if you have a question, go ahead. I'm not going to proceed until we get a question. I need one, one question. Uh, where do you do your authentication and the authorization? Yeah, so I've added, so this in, in this reference architecture here, I have a online store. I've added in a Spring Cloud OAuth 2. I have my user service. and. Uh, this is gonna, these are backing services. So I have a user service, an edge service, a discovery service, and configuration server. And my front end, I have my online store web. And then I have my back end microservices. So we can see here that the online store web is not connected directly to these back end microservices. It's going to communicate with them through this edge service. 
but the user service is going to um, act as our gateway for any protected resources. Uh, so the user service uh, is going to try and, uh, sorry, the online store web is trying to uh, access the edge service. It's going to be redirected to the user service if it's unauthent un un unauthenticated. And it's going to have a token uh, that it's in its headers uh, for its authentication state, which it's going to pass along and forward to the backend services. So I'll go over it more. How does the backend service validate the token? How does the backend service validate the session? The token. You mentioned that mm -hmm. the authentication token will be passed to the backend service. Yeah. So it's going to be stored in the headers, right? So if we contact the online store web, here's, uh, it's going to have that in the header. So it's going to contact the user service automatically. And it's going to pass that to the user service and validate that session state. So it'll return back a response that it's OK. And we'll have our session state available in our application. The uh, backend services do this as well. It preserves and forwards on that authentication header to all of the other services. So each one of these services can also call back to the user service to authenticate that session. So the session state is a maintained edge service. Is that, is that how it works? It's going to for any request, even when the edge service forwards downstream requests to the microservices, it's still going to forward the header that came in through the uh, user application, the online store web. So it, it's just going to pass that along in the header. And these services are going to have to re-authenticate. Basically, just call the user service to authenticate that session. So for every call, um, uh, the backend service will have to Call the user service for authentication? Yeah, so this is mapped in memory. So it's in memory, and we're going to scale it. Um, also, can contact the database. You can also use cache. So you can have a like couch-based cluster. Um, so there's a lot of ways to optimize how fast this is. But yeah, that's a very secure model. But then um, that's actually going to have some overhead. Sure. Uh, because every month the service for every call, will have to make a call to the user service for validating the authentication. Yeah, I mean. Absolutely, right? There's going to be a trade off here with this architecture. Now, that's a very secure way to be assured that they're only accessing the resources that they're supposed to. Um, but you also can just use the edge service as the gateway and say, I trust that that user is correct and these services don't need to re authenticate. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? What's the edge service do? Here, I think I saw hands first. There's another variant of microservices, self-contained system. Sorry. A self-contained system. Do you hear that before? Microservice self-contained. Self-contained. I haven't heard of. Okay. Because for those for the architecture, they have their own UI as a service. Um, from database to the business to the UI is a service. Yeah. So I'm way between the self-contained system and this architecture. Is it a three-tier architecture? Uh, no, no, no. It's a microservice. Yeah, I haven't heard. Which, where did you hear about it? It's from the app. OK. Well, you'll have to show me that later. So I can yeah, it was stated that there is another variant of microservices. Okay. It's quite popular. That's why I'm looking at the Eurocar itself. It's a self-contained system because it provides the UI together with the as a service. So I, to me, it's like a self-contained system. I've heard that be called a back-end for front-end. A BFF, Sam Newman talks about it in his book on building microservices, but I haven't heard the term self contained system. You'll have to show up the point. Um, any other questions? Yeah, what the edge service do? The edge service is going to act as a gateway, which is just going to embed all the REST APIs that are exposed from these microservices here in the back end. So the online store web isn't going to communicate directly with those backend services. It's going to use the edge service. And we have an Angular JS application here. So it's actually going to embed the URLs into its own application so that um, we can access that as a part of our own host. I can show you. I'll show you that in a second. So, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, edge service is going to act as the API gateway. Is that, is that correct? The edge service is the API gateway in this case, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my question is something like uh, when you go with the microservices, okay, you can have scale it like that. But if you go in reporting level, like if you have to generate a report, so there's no relation now because users is in different database, uh, records of the online, st other stores in different database. 
So how we actually create a report here? Probably we'll go with the data warehousing where you put all your data. Otherwise, because it's hard to query, right? Like if you have to check, uh, there's no foreign constraint or anything which I can see from here. So one architecture I've seen that creates a data warehouse from the different microservices uses a transaction log. So you'll have maybe Apache Kafka that's used by all services. And anything that touches the database is going to be added as an event to Apache Kafka. And these are going to have an exact order. So I can use uh, any database I want to replicate the exact uh, domain of all of the applications in a single database. And I can use that as my data warehouse. That's one way to solve it. Otherwise, you have to contact. You can either contact directly. If you're just doing reporting, it's fine to contact the databases and read. Um, so you can do that as well. Any other questions? So just one, uh, maybe a dumb question, maybe. Oh, it's fine. Um, I mean, we used to have modular application long, long time ago. Yeah. And now you have split the database to make the microservices. Mm -hmm. So what technology has made it uh, enabled in a way to come to this architecture? And why it was not, like, so many years ago, why it was not? Because there was some fashion earlier. And maybe this question goes back to this point. Mm -hmm. Because people were centralizing database for other purposes. So what is the downside of this architecture? There are certainly downsides, right? This isn't just you know green fields and first thing, what is the enabling technology that brought you to this architecture? Right. So this the is second one is what is the downside? Yep. So the to answer the first question, it's all about velocity going into production. That is to scale an engineering organization, I can have independent uh, units of deployment for each application. I don't have to have one monolithic application where I'm increasing. That's, that's the objective. That's the objective. What technology has enabled you to come with this architecture, which was not possible question? before. Go ahead, Sergio. Yeah. Um, so I think the enabler was the cloud, cloud platforms. So if you think about, let's say, five years ago, for you to actually build a service on the internet, you had to, to build a data center, which was capital expensive. So you basically had to build a facility, put service into it, rack it, uh, put electricity, cables, then secure it. Now you can actually pay, compute with a credit card. So the barrier to entry has decreased uh, exponentially. Like It's really now I can go to run the pivotal IO and I can run my application within seconds. I don't need to go to approvals. I don't need to talk to security guys. I don't need to talk to the finance facilities. So this a lower the barrier. The second is, I think, the technology. So if you look at the microservices part, one of the advantages is that you want to deploy it more often and as needed. So in order for you to actually adopt a microservice architecture, you need to learn how to do continuous delivery. That means that uh, as, a, as a company, you need to be able to do 20 releases per day. So if you look back five years or 10 years ago, doing these sort of uh, releases was also very expensive because you have to connect to the load balancer, to the global uh, traffic controller, to the local global traffic controller, to the DNS. Now everything is being API driven, so I can do an Amazon call or a vSphere call or OpenStack call, which is software. So basically, the fact that we now can pay compute power and buy any resources from the cloud be a, a card and a, as a utility bill, it's one. And then the second one, because we have APIs to talk to the hardware and to the compute and to all the resources. So these are the two enablers to the microservice architecture. Like if you would do microservice architecture five, ten years ago, you'd have to pay millions or even billions to be competitive. Now we just the barrier is very, very low. And you can see examples of this at Netflix, at, at Amazon, right? So they're using microservice architectures for a reason, which is that they want to move faster, be more flexible, and use the cloud. Now, what was the downside? The downside is that now you, you don't have the safety net, right? So for you to actually deploy uh, a new change in a monolith, it's much easier, because it's, it's a matter of adding an if statement. If you want to deploy a new microservice, then you're basically building from that. You know, my operating system, my middleware, my uh, REST endpoint. 
because it's a full stack, right? The whole microservice that you have user service, it's a replica of a catalog service. So you need to invest in all the infrastructure top down. But because you're using, let's say, Linux kernel, you're using containers framework that was built in the open source community, you're leveraging all that intellectual property. So it's no longer an investment from your company. It's basically you are uh, sitting on the shoulders of giants and you just implement the business logic. The disadvantage is that you don't add an if statement, you're creating another deployable unit which needs to be managed, which needs to have a product manager so you have a product roadmap. Uh, now uh, troubleshooting becomes an issue because you have cross-cutting consents across multiple services. So if you're thinking about the transaction, it will go not to a single monolith, and then you are able to troubleshoot very easily. But it goes through three, four, five, as many as needed. So you have to have a culture of test-driven development so that you make sure that the quality that you build into each individual service is uh, a priority and it's not a byproduct. Then the second is you need to invest in the DevOps culture so that the team that develops is also operating it. And third, you need to have buy-in from the business that they need to have the loss. If there's no need from the business to make changes, then you should not invest into having uh, releases that often. Right? It's, it's a prerequisite of your business. If you are working into a well-defined manner where releasing once in a month is fine, you don't need all these benefits. But if you are deploying a mobile application that changes every day, has new application or you are working with wearables, then you need that uh, power and flexibility. That's a very good answer. Any other questions? Uh, all these services, uh, any dependencies? Like uh, the order service can depend on the cup service. The order service? Uh, any dependency between, if I have dependency between these two microservices, mm -hmm. uh, because your architecture sounds like all these are uh, different with the service oriented architecture. Yeah. Yeah, because the service oriented uh, architecture have depend on each other, but for this one, mm -hmm. also yeah. can depend on each other. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's take a look at that. Uh, so I have this application uh, source code here. And uh, We'll go ahead and look at the order service. So I have a REST API here that's exposed uh, for the order service, which um, it's going to, uh, the basic idea here is that uh, you can use this to create an order, right? So if I go to the order service uh, class here, I can see that I'm using a OAuth 2 REST template that's going to be a load balance, so similar to what I showed you earlier. Um, and if we go to the uh, create order, actually, yeah, I'll show you a different one. Yeah, so here I'm validating the account number. So I'm calling the uh, account service. So I'm similar to what I showed you earlier with that load balance REST client. I just specify account dash service and I call that um, at the end point here. Um, and I'm gonna provide, since I'm already authenticated, it's just gonna give me the state of that user. Um, what I can do here is that I can just map this to a local POJO that I have. So I've just defined exactly the fields I need for the account object. So I have this POJO um, in the account service itself. So from the order service, all I need to do is have this POJO, this class of uh, just what I need. So I'm not gonna share dependencies or libraries between these services. I'm just going to create a basic POJO here uh, which I can use to uh, basically uh, deserialize the response and map it to my object. So it's a very simple model. I don't need to uh, take the full object that's defined. Maybe later I want to upgrade the, to change the API. Uh, so you use versioned APIs, and you just have to remember we have that consumer-driven testing module. So if there are any changes uh, to that POJO that break this model, uh, they won't be able to deploy it into production. Does the screen provide a, a feature for us to see which service is using, using my service? So that I can know that when I need the testing, which other service I need to take care of. 
Yeah, we provide distributed tracing. So you can use Zipkin, which will visualize that. Um, but if you really just wanted to get an idea of uh, who's requesting your service, you can use Actuator. I had that running earlier um, and used the trace feature. So let's see if I have this running. I think I uh, did away with it. Localhost 8080. Oh, here it is. Uh, so I have a trace endpoint here, which is going to show me. This is going to show me every request to my service, so I can see here exactly how it's being used, and uh, that might be one way. Uh, that's how I would do it. Yeah. You can also pass along an ID. You can onboard certain applications who should be using this this app, and you can validate them uh, against a set of resources. With the Edge service here. If I go to that configuration, I can see that um, in this edge service, which this, remember this is the API gateway, um, I can specify that I'm only going to contact the account service, payment service, inventory service, order service, user service, and catalog service, as well as the shopping cart. So I can certainly make sure that my applications are only communicating with who they should be communicating with. Any other questions? Uh, how do you stop the service in production email? I could run this comment just now you demonstrate. Yeah. Okay. The, Sorry. Uh, the server was being rebooted. This service will be, not be on automatically. Uh, I haven't rebooted any. I had it running from before. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, how do you uh, stop these uh, services in the production environment? Cool, that's a good question. I can actually show you that with uh, Cloud Foundry. Uh, so I have, uh, if you go to run.pivotal.io, uh, we provide a hosted instance of Cloud Foundry. Uh, and you can, I've created a manifest for each one of these services. This is the Edge service. I can go ahead and I can push this to that production environment. Uh, so here I have my uh, manifest YAML, which is going to specify the name of the service, the memory, some other information, uh, also the services that it depends on. Uh, so I can go ahead and I'm just going to show you, can I show you to push this production? Uh, so I'm going to go to that directory. CD. So here's all of the, uh, the services. And uh, I'll go to the edge service. Uh, and we can see here that if I do CF apps, so I have a command line client for Cloud Foundry. You can see all the running applications. Uh, so this is pretty ugly. I have the UI up here. Um, I don't know what that's all about. I've been tethering a Sergio's phone all day and run up all of his usage. <laughs> okay, so here I have the Pivotal Web Services UI and uh, I can actually just visualize those applications. So here are all my apps and I can see the instance count of each application. Um, so these are all the services in that diagram. Um, now what I'd like to do is just push the edge service So I'll go ahead and actually, I'm going to scale this down real quick. And uh, I can just do CF push here from the command line. Now that's going to look at that manifest file. And it's going to go through the process of uh, creating a container for that application, uploading the jar, and deploying it to <coughs> that environment. I can actually stream logs from this. So if I can do CF logs edge service. <coughs> so now it's uploading. Sorry? How 
file. Uh, there's a template provided. You can also use CF command line to generate it, but it's a it's in the documentation. Um, it's very basic. It's kind of like a little bit like Docker Compose. And any second, so we see that it's binding to the discovery service, to the config service, to the user service. Now it's restarting the application. And we should be able to see some log output here. Yeah. So this is uh, the application starting up. It looks like it failed. Um, oh no, it just shut it down. So now it's uh, creating a container for it. It's calculating the memory. <coughs> And now it's going to start the application. And so now we see the log output from the application starting up, just like if it was local. And we can see it's now started and registering with the discovery service. So if I go to the discovery service, which I have running, I can uh, go ahead and see information about the edge service that I just deployed. So we can see that I um, deprovisioned that one instance. So and we have the new instance here. So I actually I can open this up should be unprotected. Uh, I can't actually look at it because uh, it's protected. I have to actually assert my authentication credentials. But I'm going to show you the finished application. If I go to online store web, and just to go through the diagram, the top we have our online store. Uh, that's what we're looking at here, online store web. Uh, so I'm calling from the uh, front end, I'm calling the catalog service. I'm returning back a set of products from the catalog. <coughs> Um, we can see that I'm not authenticated. Um, if I go to one of the uh, products in the catalog, I can see information about that. So that's uh, contacting the catalog service, which is contacting the inventory service. Um, I can go ahead and log in here. Um, this is going to redirect me to the user service, where I have a authentication gateway. I can log in. Oops, not admin, user. <laughs> Uh, so now I can approve that grant. So I'm redirected back to the application, and uh, we can see now I'm, not, I'm now authenticated as user John Doe. Uh, and now I have some more options here. So I can actually go to settings. This is going to contact the account service. Uh, it's going to get information about that user's account. I can look at their orders, which we'll call the order service. I can uh, also start adding products to the cart. So I'll go ahead and add a few of <coughs> these. Now, if I go to the cart, I can see the products that I've added. Um, I'm going to have to decrease these because I can't afford. I can't afford. That. I really can't. So if I <laughs> try to check out, I get an error. So. OK, so now I'm going to check out here. So this, all this has done is uh, it's contacted the cart service and changed the quantities. I can go ahead and check out. Now, now an order has been created for that user for those items. And uh, so that's the, the basic idea. I do provide this as a tutorial if you um, and an open source project. So you can run it yourself. Uh, you can deploy it to PWS or run it locally. Um, I have the tutorial on my, uh, my blog. It's just myname.com. And uh, you can walk through this. It's going to explain, really, this explains more about eventual consistency in microservices uh, and event sourcing, which I haven't gone over uh, today. Uh, but it does provide a uh, working tutorial of this application that you can go and run on your own. Uh, so I recommend taking a look at it. It walks through step by step. So if, if I uh, spoke too fast, Tonight, I apologize. This is the 12th time I've done the talk in the last week. <laughs> um, and so, uh, 
been working on the other cloud platform? Yeah, I, I have it working. It will work on another cloud platform. Actually, I'm supposed to tell you it won't. <laughs> <laughs> just, just Pivotal Web Services. Um, yeah, so take a look at it. Uh, it's a pretty comprehensive tutorial. Um, and uh, you can run it locally if you want to as well. Here's the, uh, the Git repository uh, on GitHub. Uh, so you can see each of those uh, services here. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about it. So I'm going to put up my contact information. I'm going to stick around. I have more slides, but uh, I'll just put up my contact information. If uh, you want to get in contact with me, uh, please uh, go ahead and email me. And if you have any questions, if you're up late at night wondering about microservices and you need someone to talk to, just email me. It's fine. Uh, and then follow me on Twitter, of course. So thank you very much for having me. Um, it's great to be here. So thank you.